Welcome everyone to this community call from Inner Source Commons on incentivizing culture change. I am delighted to be joined here today with our three fabulous panelists. We have uh, Wolfgang from Mercedes-Benz, I'm probably pointing in the right direction. Wolfgang, say hello. Uh, we have Michaela from IBM. Michaela, if you'd like to wave and say hello, brilliant. And Katie hello. from Indeed. <laughs> delighted to have you all with us here today and uh, to talk about this incredibly interesting topic uh, that has come up many times from our community in terms of uh, asking for advice and tips. So we're here to discuss all the best practices practices, all your ideas, and hopefully some of your challenges as well, because they're always the, the good, um, good, interesting ones to dig into deeply. So um, what I will ask for first is maybe if you can give a little bit of an overview about uh, who you are, what your role is with your organization, and, uh, and specifically in relation to inner source in your company. So who would like to go first? Wolfgang, will we come to you first? I'll keep the same order in my screen here. Right. Thank you so much, Claire. So hi everyone, my name is uh, Wolfgang Gehring. I work for Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation, which is a 100% subsidiary, IT subsidiary of the Mercedes-Benz group. And uh, we were just recently renamed, uh, we used to be called the Daimler and uh, the whole company was Daimler and then Daimler TSS was my, my workplace, but now we're yeah, Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation. Um, so I am a member of the FOSS Center of Competence of Mercedes-Benz, and I also lead the open source group at uh, Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation. And uh, so when I say FOSS, free and open source software, that does incorporate inner source as well. So we don't really have two separate groups or distinguish really. Uh, it's We treat inner source and open source in the same uh, working group. Thank yeah. you, Wolfgang. That's enough for now. Then Michaela, perhaps. Huh? Brilliant, pass the button, Michaela. All right, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Michaela and I am uh, the program lead for InnerSource at IBM. I work in the CIO's office um, within an, a group that's a, a subdomain called um, the developer experience. And so one of the things we're really working on is ensuring that uh, we've got solid experiences for developers when they uh, join IBM, that they have the tools they need. And we believe that InnerSource is a critical element uh, to ensuring that uh, is available for developers. Um, to share, to innovate, to, to do all these wonderful things. So um, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Mine's not quite as, as, as extensive as yours, Wolfgang. I'm feeling like I should say more things, but th th that's pretty much it. It's simple. <laughs> we'll dig in deeper. Don't you worry, Michaela. I know, I know, I know I'm not worried. All right, Katie, you're up next. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. I'm Katie Schuitz. I am at Indeed, and I am in the open source program office as a senior um, technical project manager, but I am the working on the research and starting our inner source program. Our inner source program is not its own office yet. We are still in the development phase. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Right. So to get kick started, um, when we've had conversations about incentivizing culture change in the past, uh, typically the discussion centers on either the kind of personal, psychological, individual level incentivization or people talk about the organizational level incentive structures that might be in place. So I am going to ask you all now to consider that on both cases and to think about when we think about incentivizing culture change as it relates to inner source, what springs to mind as being, you know, the most important levers to pull in, in respect to that. Um, so maybe we'll go, Katie, let's start with you this time around. Um, well, with us in the beginning phases, we are right now looking at incentivizing um, how the um, corporate level can change rubrics for people to measure their own behaviors based on um, long-term projected results. So our personal evaluations are how we're addressing it at the moment. Okay, so so from a formal organizational perspective, this is actually built into your review process in terms of actually helping people. And and from your experience, do you think that that is is something that in Indeed does it have a history of actually changing behavior? I, I, for, for in transparency, my background is Microsoft, and I know that their incentive programs and their review process was very tightly 
connected to their change programs and seem to have a great impact is it yes. the same and indeed yes all of we're very metrics driven so everybody measures what they are doing based on their goals and their quarterly um, objectives so having something tied in with our rubric and directly um, correlated to the job description and what people are looking at as they build toward promotion or build toward the next level is highly incentivized we tie it directly into how can we help people get jobs that's fantastic and i'll also note that in previous conversations we we've all noted that the kinds of skills that make you good at inner source are usually really good transferable skills for business anyway so they're really good ones to call out as being part of professional development anyway um, michaela i'll come to you next what, what what is happening in ibm in terms of incentivizing either from a personal or a or organizational level perspective so the, the, the approach we've taken is both a top down bottoms up approach and so recognizing that we have to reach people where they are, but also knowing that we need to have institutional uh, incentives that are going to um, provide recognition for folks so that they can feel like what they're doing is moving in the right direction so you know following up on what Katie was talking about, you know, like, like many tech organizations, we are also very metrics driven, we need to, you know, people want to understand, uh, you know, what's in it for them, how do they need to participate, how do they get better. Um, you know, we also are really trying very hard to, uh, we're also borrowing from social media, though, as well, in the sense that, you know, how do we create things, uh, and, and sort of, um, you know, uh, excitement, around what we're doing. So making it fun as well. So, you know, we can be as dry as we want and we can incentivize people as much as we want. It still won't get the level of adoption and stickiness that we want from a cultural standpoint. So we recognize we have to reach people on both levels. We need to reach them just on an intrinsic level where you're intrinsically motivated to participate because it's fun, it's exciting, it's interesting, um, and it's a safe place to innovate, to fail. And um, we actually have that as part of our, um, uh, our uh, rules, uh, community rules, which is, you know, you have to incorporate that into the, you know, everything that we do, and we have to trust each other to do that. And so giving people an opportunity to do that, you don't get to normally do that in your day job. And so the idea here is really to create a safe space for that to actually occur, which theoretically is where innovation comes from, is the ability to be able to try things out, see what happens, and then go from there. So we're tr really trying to incorporate the notion of innovation. And then the second thing we've, we've sort of adopted is this notion of um, and while it's not like an incentive, but it's a it's just a behavior pattern that we're trying to instill in others, which is the pay it forward, right? How are you going to pay it forward? Uh, you know, again, it's a rewards in the sense of I actually am going to reward the next person coming behind me by making this experience a good one for them. I'm going to try and help others uh, along the, the process and giving back is actually a great way to get people motivated to participate in things. So really both a top down and a bottoms up approach. We have the, and we do have, you know, incentives tied to both career progression um, as well as like, you know, we have like annual rewards. Um, we're in the process of transitioning our um Pro, one of our programs from, uh, we're very he heavily oriented towards patents and doing patents. And so we're now trying to put a balance between uh, patent uh, patent filings and uh, and inner source and open source. So making those two, two things work together a bit more holistically than they have in the past. So we're, we're still in the process. We don't know whether all of that's gonna work. So we're trying a lot of different things to see what, what does work. Uh, and then, you know, at some point we'll come back and share, share, share how it all turned out at the end of the year. Thanks, thanks, Michaela. Um, Wolfgang, what about from your experience at Mercedes-Benz? So uh, when we started doing open and inner source first, say about six years ago or so, um, we went about the whole thing very methodically. So we created processes, you know, what do you have to do when you want to use open source? What do you have to do when you contribute to open source or collaborate with inner source partners? Um, then so processes then we had uh, we, we developed uh, internal trainings that uh, people had to do uh, how to collaborate what to regard when it comes down to licenses and so forth and then not much happened right uh, so we had the processes and the trainings and we're like okay people go it's uh do it right and it's part of our it strategy what's keeping you well uh it is that cultural change and in a big company, I guess it takes a longer time in smaller companies, but people were still unsure 
because you know like seven eight years ago people weren't allowed to do open source or inner source um and so people were like yeah but okay so it's part of the strategy but are we really allowed to contribute to open source projects um can we do this in our working time and uh, things like that right so we felt we needed a bit more we needed something more radical to change people mind, people's minds and to get the cultural change going. So we created uh, the Mercedes-Benz FOSS Manifesto. And uh, the, so the FOSS Manifesto is a, a set of, of core values and guidelines uh, that don't only allow people to, to participate in open inner source, but actually sends them on a mission to do exactly that. And so it's a, a set of these principles and guidelines and it tells people, hey, not only are you allowed to, you, you please go be active in inner source, be active in open source. And yes, of course, you can do this in your working time, right? And so we distributed that and, you know, a lot of, a lot of legwork, a lot of internal communication. And uh, so by now, I hope it has reached the majority of people. And, and it, I, I think it contributes to the cultural change quite a bit. Well, um, it sounds like, I mean, you know, when, when, when remembering back some of the, the change books that I've read or books on change management, the whole idea of being clear about your strategy and then, you know, removing blockers and motivating uh, the, the, the change, uh, they're all factors. And it sounds like the manifesto actually helps with the clarity. Um, and I would imagine from, from how you've described as well, uh, Michaela and Katie, um, that when you actually change the incentive programs of the company and, and that, 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 that efforts and inner sources recognize there that that also is a signal of clarity, right? It's a signal that this is the direction that the company goes in. Um, but one of the questions that came in in the chat, and this is this is just to 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 perhaps uh, dig a little bit deeper into that, is there a risk that um, that perhaps by doing that that somehow the behavior changes back again? It, you know, if it is effective in terms of changing behavior, that if if suddenly it's not the top thing on your metrics list or the top thing that your manager asks about, that that might actually, um, you know, not be a lasting uh, cultural change factor? Or do you see it as a kind of a necessary first go so that people change their behavior and then perhaps it doesn't need quite so much emphasis later on? So I'll put that open. Who, who would like to maybe comment on that? I'll go ahead and take that since I mentioned that I was doing both a top down and bottoms up approach. Um, primarily, that's actually the reason that we've adopted that approach, because, you know, one of the concerns that I've had and, and having been part of these kinds of programs in the past, um, you know, where we've made that shift, but we haven't considered the impact that that those sh those changes are going to have or what happens when the strategy of the company changes to the point that we have another transformation and something else happens and you have to move. Um, the idea here was to instill the behavior changes in such a way that we both foster them from that um, from that organizational um, standpoint, but then you know really looking at it to try and provide motivation that is less tied to those things, so that if that went away tomorrow, we would already have teams that would be sharing with each other that we'd already have that as part of the culture instead of you know having that be so quite so tied now. I don't anticipate that that's going to happen within IBM. There's pretty solid sort of plans for this for the next couple of years. So, you know, that I mean, there's a there's a sol solid, strong commitment to doing that. So I don't know that we would be going down this path had, had that commitment not been made. Um, but at the same time, recognizing that, you know, things change and we need to be prepared for those changes. And so how do we how do we address those changes and do them in a holistic way? So, yeah, it was a risk that we talked about very early on. It was something we were really concerned about, um, given, you know, past experiences and past transformations that we've done. And so just you know, making sure that we're trying to create the the incentives, you, you know, beyond just fixing the processes, you know, Wolfgang, as you mentioned, it's just like, yeah, build it and they will come. That's not exactly quite how it works. We have to give them a reason to participate, a reason to be there. Um, and so that's why fun actually is something that we're trying to bring back into the notion of, you know, of work, right? Like we've been very, it's very sort of metrics driven, it's very holistic, but it, there's some intangibles that you can't really sort of ignore. And I think it's important for us to recognize that people want to at least enjoy what they're doing for a little while. So, you know, we're trying to create enjoyable, fun experiences and we're treating Intersource as an experience, not just a process or a methodology or any of these other kinds of things. We're looking at it holistically as how do we participate in this experience of Intersource beyond just 
we're making contributions, it's reuse, it's this, it's that, beyond just the principles, what's the experience like for individuals, for teams, for the organization as a whole, and really trying to approach it from that vantage point and thinking about it in that way. So that's, you know, yeah, it is a risk, but it's one of those that I think if you tackle it um, little bit by little bit, you can you can probably sort of, you know, build in, I don't know if it's a safety net, but you can you can build it in such a way that even if that were to go away, you have other things that will 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 um, continue keeping things uh, moving forward. Well, it sounds it sounds like there's a lots of tools in the toolbox that can be leveraged as part of this journey. And, and you know, some some may be, you know, great at particular points in time, like when you're kickstarting the initiative and some may be longer lasting. Um, but but it's probably important to make sure that everyone has the full, you know, smorgasbord of options to to, to be able to to pull all the levers because God knows culture change is hard. So um, so the more help we can all get, the better. Um, and it, it strikes me even from hearing you all describe this uh, because in many cases you're talking about kind of company-wide rollouts or you know a clear strategic direction for the organization um, and and so the incentive the incentivization required for um for folks who may be new to inner source who may not have done it in the past and have no history of that kind of collaboration may in fact be different than those folks that you know are more inclined to that kind of collaboration or where where you're driving increased um uh kind of engagement and contributions so can i ask you to maybe reflect on you know is there a change there you know when you're thinking about getting someone kickstarted for the first time first contribution versus this idea of actually i've you know dipped my toe in but we just want them to do more of it and kind of get you know more practiced and more competent in that area different th different approaches that you might have for that scenario uh, Katie or Wolfgang, if, if you want to go next. Well, uh, indeed, um, we already have a very open and transparent internal process. Our difficulties and people want to contribute. We have groups that are already contributing with each other, but everyone has a different process. Mm -hmm. There's no consistency across the organization. Okay. So right now we are working on incentivizing a change for um, improving health of practices. Okay. And we're trying to enable the process to make things easier for people so they aren't as stressed. We're improving quality mm -hmm. versus starting it from the beginning. And I think that's changed what our metrics are looking like a little bit in terms of how we're incentivizing it. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a culture change because our focus is on documentation at the moment. Right. But we have, um, in terms of getting people, our on the getting people started for us is our onboard, onboarding process when we bring somebody new into the company who isn't used to that. Mm -hmm. And for us, that is, their team is going to be the introduction. And get adjusting to the culture of their individual team because it's a team-wide effort and the teams are going to be more incentivized than the individuals but it's a very much a team and collaborative culture that we're working with I love that. And, and, you know, it's worth, you know, really important point that that the culture that you might be starting with may be different in different organizations and therefore different levers might be appropriate in, in, in those contexts. Um, and I love the point you made about the fact that the team itself um, potentially has a culture that you can influence that might be even longer lasting than the individuals. You know, there's sometimes you can set those kind of team level culture change that's not even individual or organizational, but but can be really impactful in terms of actually um, setting a set of norms or practices to actually go forward with. So great call out there. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Wolfgang, how about from your perspective? Um, so we have the same processes uh, throughout the entire uh, corporation. You know, I don't know, understood, Katie, I understood that you said some teams have different processes for, yeah, okay. No, we have the, the same for, for everyone. And they're, they're also, uh, we ask team members, new ones, uh, that they take the trainings. Like we have a, a, a special dedicated inner source training. We have uh, trainings for open source, you know, like awareness of open source, then uh, how, what to consider when you use open source, licenses and so forth. 
uh, one training for how to make open source contributions, then how to do your own open source project, and uh, one training specially dedicated to inner source, right? But then they have to follow, like all the employees have to follow the identical processes for contributions or for creation, whatever. Um, the, so then in terms of incentivization, so people are motivated to contribute, I think to a bigger degree in open source, because you know they don't randomly pick a project in open source. Uh, obviously, it's one that they use. Then they find a bug or they need a new feature, so they you know create pull requests and upstream their changes. And for inner source, uh, we're struggling a bit with with um, contributions coming from inner source. So open source is is already somehow working better, um, because the thing about it is you need. You know, people will only contribute if it is if it does them any good, if they if they if it if it helps their pain, right? They will not contribute to an inner source project that oh that's an interesting project that's a good idea but yeah sorry I don't have the time. Only if it is helping them as well. So we have a few inner source projects that are going really well, and it's that kind of project that you know provides a solution that a lot of people need. And the other ones, of course, I mean. I, I, they will probably not be successful. I mean, let's, okay, 2% of all open source projects are successful. And I don't think that number is gonna be any different in inner source, right? No, it's a good point. I mean, the, you know, the 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 you know, we talk about incentivizing as if it's a vanilla kind of you know, slap it on and everyone gets incentivized the same way. But it very much depends on the individual motivations, the organizational culture that you're starting with, the clarity from the top, and the projects, which I think is the the point you're making there, Wolfgang. Like, you know, there'll be some that you want to contribute to, there's some that you'll be made contribute to, but uh, but it may not happen as organically if the, if, the, if 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 that's the case. So Michaela, you're waving there. What would you like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that I, you know, we we kind of realized late last year, uh, one of my colleagues had kind of come up with the notion, and and she'd actually mentioned it on one of a, a previous sort of you know introduction. Uh, her name's Olivia Buzek, and so we have a previous sort of, um, I think during one of the um, um, summits that you guys had, she had presented sort of yeah, she had presented our journey, and one of the concepts that we've sort of evolved is this notion of an inner source catalyst. So what are certain types of, what are things that are good catalysts for making good inner source, uh, making inner source work and inner source successful? And one of them is, so at a project level, the thing that we found is that there are two elements that we think are great catalysts for that. And, and one of them is something that is common and the business absolutely needs. It's a must have, everybody needs to do it. We're wasting a lot of money, um, you know, doing it in silos. We're, we're, you know, we're not helping each other out, you know, so having that sort of, you know, the business desperately needs it. Everybody's working on essentially the same thing, but we're all doing it in different ways. So that's one good catalyst. And so, you know, things that fall into that category often, and one of the projects we've got right now is a, a CICD pipeline, a, a consistent common CICD pipeline. Uh, that we can then use across IBM. There's, you know, there may be different technologies, but the processes are the same. So we're trying to evolve into uh, having that sort of holistic, um, you know, uh, uh, centralized way and common way of, of addressing that because of varying degrees of uh, understanding of how to do DevOps and things like that. Um, and then another thing that we really find that is a great catalyst is things that are bleeding edge, cutting edge, things that come out of research, um, AI, quantum, all these other sorts of very bleeding edge technologies are other great catalysts because A, it's exciting to get involved in something that's new and different. We all love new technology, but we all love to try new things. Uh, and so that becomes another one that, that is a great motivator. So one of them that comes from the business and the other one that comes from individuals become really great um, candidates. And then in order to be able to do those things successfully, you have to have the underpinnings. Um, Wolfgang, you talked about having the same consistent processes. We're doing the same thing within ours. We're trying to bootstrap that. We don't have that across all areas of IBM, which is the reason why my group is in the CIO, because our, our role within IBM is to try things out and make sure that it's working consistently and then sharing it with the rest of IBM. So starting with CIO, that's what we're focusing in on. And then we're, we're, we'll be you know branching out, but we're trying to get it right, get consistent around the things that we really care about, creating templates, creating reusable assets, things that are repeatable, 
um, that others can use. So that's kind of the baseline foundational things that need to happen to enable that collaboration in the first place. So those are kind of just sort of like, I keep thinking of this notion of catalyst and, and that's what really makes a good open source project successful. If it's old, older sort of technology or if it's been around a while and nobody really cares that much about it or it's kind of like on the shelf, you know, it's stuff that's kind of, uh, you know, not top of mind those tend to be a little bit less successful. So we're, we're putting together training to help um, people understand, like, how do I know that my inner source project is the right project? And I think the last catalyst is really making sure that um, it's inner source, it's inner source or even open source ready. It, is it modularized enough? Is the architecture structured? Is the documentation there? What are the things? So just sort of really asking yourself as a, as a, person who's trying to start an inner source project or even an open source project, what do you need to put in place for your project to be successful within the space? Just kicking it over the fence, plopping it somewhere in a space and saying, oh, it's ready now, anybody can use it, isn't sufficient. You need to actually do more than that to en ensure that there is success within open source if you want your project to be successful in the first place. So th those are the kinds of key things that we're, we're really looking at and trying to kind of um, you know, uh, s systematize. Uh, and make it sort of systematic across the board. Thanks, thanks, Michaela. And and I suppose I'll, I'll just add in here just from previous discussions to to maybe uh, look a little bit as well about that kind of uh, idea of how you motivate people from an intrinsic perspective or from from their own you know personal perspective as well as just extrinsic kind of rewards or from an organizational perspective because a lot of what we talked about here today is really that organizational level. Um, and it looks like we have lots more to discuss and we're probably going to run out of time. But but I but I'll also mention that you know certainly. And Wolfgang referred to it actually in, in, in the context of um, making sure that people can scratch their own itch, giving people the, the ability to solve their own problems, we know has been a, a really great um, intrinsic motivator for people. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it's always important to recognize this thread of, of enlightened self-interest that, you know, there, there sometimes can be the assumption that people will just decide to go off and dabble in other people's projects. But, but I think what I'm hearing here is a trend that if we can, if we can identify the patterns that make most sense for both the project and the individuals where there's a mutual beneficial synchronicity, something going on there, that that can be very, very, very motivating for all parties concerned, um, rather than trying to slap on kind of vanilla incentives that may not fit every pattern. Um, would that be an accurate kind of description? Anyone want to kind of comment on that or, or anything else that you can think of from a personal perspective? And we'll do this as, as our last round before we open up to the, to the community discussion. But thinking about it less from an organizational perspective and more from an individual perspective, anything that you can also point to that really helps motivate people to get involved? Katie? Um, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, whichever. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll go then. So, uh, first of all, right, the organizational uh, prerequisites have to be there. You know, what we talked about um, the enablement, and Michaela said templates and processes and things like that. And then, for a, an individual project to be successful in inner source, I think four, four things have to be uh, met, four prerequisites. The first one is there has to be a, a dedicated project team. Um, you know, who act as maintainer for the project. That's kind of like a duh. Yeah, but you know, there are people think they put their project somewhere on the inner source platform and then it's there. And if it's good, people will like it. And that's just not happening, right? So it has to be, a, it has to have a dedicated project team. Number two, um, it has to scratch the itch of many people. If it's just a few people, you know, then okay, a few people will be happy, but if successful, meaning large community, then many itches, uh, no. Uh, yeah, many itches. And then uh, the third one, it, it has to contain something that is company specific, like, you know, Mercedes Benz specific stuff, because if that isn't the case, then it's an open source project, right? Yeah. You could, of course, incubate something in inner source first and then bring it to open source, right? That's but if it's an inner source and stays inner source, it would have to be company specific something. And then the fourth one, I think this is really important too. You need community management. Mm. And you know what what is a what is a successful project? One with a large community with a lot of people, right? And as we know, it's just not the case that you throw something out there. If it's good, people will come and, and will like it. it. 
you need active community management. And a lot of times I find the developers, they don't have the community management skills mm -hmm. or time. So you should, from an, uh, the organization should provide dedicated community manager for a project and then it can be successful. Thanks. Thanks, Wolfgang. I, I now have an image of itchy projects in my head as a <laughs> Sorry great candidates, but I, which I particularly like, actually. I'll remember that one. Uh, Katie, come to you now. Our thing, so the culture at Indeed very much encourages people to have that, to have a startup mentality. If it if it's there and you need it fixed, do it. Find a solution. So we have had a lot of projects we have over 300 projects internally right now. And some of those are abandoned because just like Wolfgang said, somebody started it, it scratched an itch and they thought that they could put it out there and it would keep going. Well, we've had a lot put out there that everybody wants to keep going, but nobody wants to own. And we have projects and libraries that large communities use. They're, they're common libraries, but nobody wants to be an owner because it takes too much time and we don't, they don't have the resources or the community management experience to handle it. Yeah. And that incentive, that incentivization for the individuals is actually from what we're in the research phase, but what we are finding is providing the resources is the incentive because they already want it. People already are creating what they need, but the incentive to keep the documentation fresh, to keep the project going is to have adequate resources and support to keep the project going. Thanks, so, so, so the supports themselves, having them is incentive enough to, to actually help people move. So Michaela, we're running out of time. So final comment from you, what, what, what do you think in terms of, in terms of individual motivation? So, so yeah, so I think, I think, uh, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Wolfgang mentioned in terms of the community management, um, you know, we don't expect developers and, you know, teams to come in knowing how to build, manage, incentivize, activate their communities, we're going to provide them the support that they need to be able to do that through a number of means. One of them is community managers and using and leveraging, I mentioned social media principles and sort of practices in that context, I think the second thing that we're doing and, and really trying to experiment is partnering with dev advocacy and making sure that we have dev advocates that are involved and engaged in inner source projects to help promote them, not from a marketing or a sales perspective, but really saying and highlighting them as showcases. These are the projects that people are working on. And so we're trying to leverage them as an amplifier to the projects that we have. Now, we haven't done it across the board yet. So we're still kind of working with that idea and that concept, but a lot of organizations have dev advocates that are engaged and involved. And the goal here really is to leverage that dev advocacy along with community managers to help amplify projects uh, so that, you know, maybe if somebody needs a little extra help. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close out is that um, having a project team involved from the very, very beginning, getting it inner source ready, which means that, you have to be ready for making contributions to adopt what you have holistically and building a community. And we're calling those groups because we keep thinking, I keep thinking of Kickstarter, we're calling those starters. So these are folks that are trying to get these projects going so that they don't languish over the course of time. Cause that was one of Katie, that was one of my fears is when we got started with this in our organization was just having a bunch of projects just parked somewhere and then nobody really goes back and looks at them and to me that just feels like a waste right so how do we sort of overcome that habit that we have of just plopping it in there we have a process that we're trying to to create around this sort of starter concept and these starter teams to make sure that they understand your role isn't just to build your project it's to build your inner source project which is a completely different thing than just building something and then walking away Brilliant. Thank you, Michaela. Well, we are coming to the end of, we have come to the end of our uh, public recording. So I just want to say goodbye to everyone who's watching online and make sure to check out our next community calls on innersourcecommons.org. Um, um, but at, and, and to say a final huge thank you to our guests, Wolfgang, Michaela and Katie. So bye to everyone online. <laughs>